live on Facebook. Start in a few moments. Everybody getting ready for Shabbos, I'm sure. Welcome, Sarah Malka. All right, folks, uh, we welcome Karen in LA, Elizabeth and Joelle over here in Montreal, uh, Heather in our Connecticut. And we welcome over here, Sarah Malka, Shoshana Bina from Virginia, Sarah Malka from North Carolina, Andrew from uh, New Jersey, Morris and Israel from Montreal. Okay, wonderful. So uh, this week, we have a double header, a double portion. Uh, why these two parties are uh, come together, I'm not exactly certain why they're these particular, although Previous uh, earlier in the week, I brought a connection between the two uh, parshias that perhaps will give us some insight. Balak, oh, sorry, the first parsha being uh, Chukas, and the second parsha is being Balak. Chukas uh, are the laws that are super rational, the law of the red heifer things that are beyond us that we have a challenge to understand. And moreover, it's about coming in contact with, with death and transforming from death to life. So it's about transformation. And that's Hukas. Balak is similar. Balak was the Moabite king who hired Bilam to curse the Jews. And of course, as we know, from curses came great blessings. We'll deal with uh, one of the blessings uh, shortly, which is again, transformation from curse to blessing. So we have from death to life, we have from curse to blessing. So perhaps that is the, the connection, at least the thematic connection between the two parshas. Even though in many of the storyline, there's a lot of... Uh, very different thing, different ideas that are brought across. So let us take one of the ideas from Bilam, um, the in his desire to curse the Jews, gives blessings to the Jews. And uh, before going into it, I'd like to give a little story. Actually, it's all part of the story, the, this week's Parsha and the, the uh, blessing of Bilam. 1968, well, after 19, uh, the, the Six Day War, where uh, Yitzhak Rabin was, uh, had uh, accomplished a uh, great um, Great miracles on, on the behalf of the Jewish people. The greatest miracles when he went down to the Western Wall. And he says, I am not a religious man, but 
as he's walking to the Western Wall that was liberated, he says, but today I am a religious man <laughs> and I'm feeling very emotional about the upcoming encounter coming to the, uh, to the Western Wall. He feels extremely emotional. He was a person that was raised by a uh, very secular family. His parents came from America in 1905. He was born in Jerusalem, a very, um, very unlearned in Judaism. After the uh, Six Day War in 1972, he was appointed the ambassador of Israel to America. At that time, the president was, um, what's his name? President of Israel. The president of Israel was uh, Zalman Shazar, who was very close to the Rebbe. And he asked him, please, it was March, 1972, please go and have a private audience with the Rebbe and bring greetings on my behalf because it's his birthday. Not just his birthday, but it was his 70th birthday in 1972. And he agreed to do that on behalf of the, the state, on behalf of the Zolman Shazar, although he was very uncomfortable doing so because uh, he did not hang out with, uh, you know, that's not his place where he hung out with, with Jews. Uh, not a place where he felt very comfortable. Um, with religious Jews, that is, and especially a Hasidic Rebbe. But he is there on behalf of the Jewish people. So he's uh, waiting late at night for a private audience with the Rebbe. Before him was Herman Wolk, famous author who just passed away, I think at 104, if I'm not mistaken, or 105 uh, this past year. Celebrated author, uh, This Is My God, was one of his uh, works. And um, he was there in private audience with the Rebbe representing uh, Richard Nixon, President of the United States, and bringing greetings on uh, President Nixon's behalf. So he finally enters, um, a little unsure of himself, a little, um, what's the word, uh, cautious, um, a little anxiety, but he's there. The, the Rebbe asks him, do you feel sometimes alone in the, in, in the United Nations, right? Where there's 120 or so uh, other nations and do you feel sometimes alone? So I'm actually gonna have, so, you know, have it written out over here what he himself says. Um, so he says, it's a great honor for me to represent the state of Israel in Washington, and even if I am at times feel lonely. More than half the countries, he says, don't recognize Israel, so I don't have to worry and deal with them. <laughs> um, with the others, Israel has a friendly relations. Israel is important to me. What others think of Israel is not, I don't regard, it's not important to me. Rebbe then reports him and says, however, the United States takes into consideration what other nations say. So he re responds, not necessarily, and if yes, not too much. The Russian ambassador once told me, you are a small country, but you are a proud country. Most countries are jealous of you. This is what he responds to the Rebbe. So what the Rebbe was doing was not making light of the pressure of all the nations of the world where he was uh, making it, you know, trivializing it, it's uh, quite obvious. Now the Rebbe turns to him and says, and he quotes from this week's Parsha. That's why I'm telling the story because of the quote from this week's Parsha. The Rebbe quotes from him, from this week's Parsha, and says, from the top of the mountain, I see him. By the way, he, he spoke in Hebrew to him, in Ashkenazi Hebrew, and uh, he spoke him, of course, in, in uh, Sephardic Israeli Hebrew re responded back to him. So he says, from the top of the hills, I see him. From the hills, I behold him. It is a people that dwells alone. Um, Am Levadav Yishkoin, a people, a nation that dwells alone. 
and is not reckoned among the nations. So here's what the Rebbe asks him. This fact that the Jewish people are people that dwell alone, is that by choice or by force? He asks them the question. Is that our choosing that we choose to dwell alone? And of course, what does that mean to dwell alone? Right, That itself needs explanation. Or is it something that it's uh, foisted upon us, forced upon us by the nations of the world, be, you know, as a result of anti-Semitism and other things? I'm, I'm giving my own elaboration that Rebbe didn't say this, <laughs> right? just uh, elaborating seemingly on what the Rebbe is saying to him. He, again, as I mentioned, was not uh, very learned in in Torah, in Chumash, and uh, the Rebbe didn't even wait for his response, from what I understand, from the way he tells it over, and went right away into a, a, a long presentation and, ex and explained that we stand alone, stand apart from other nations, out of choice, because of our absolute commitment and faith that we have in our faith, in our history, and in our heritage. And this has been in all times and all conditions. Even when we have been without a land, without a nation in, a, in our holy land, and we have been persecuted, we have been the wandering Jew, nonetheless, we have always held strong to our faith, to our beliefs, and to our way. Regardless, is what the Rebbe says. And we've never lost our connection. So, this that it says that Am Levada of Yishkoin, that it's a nation that dwells alone, it's not a curse, but it's a huge blessing. The only time that it becomes a curse, the Rebbe says to him, is that when we don't recognize the uniqueness of the Jewish people. That we have a unique path, a unique heritage, and a unique history. When we won't recognize that, then that will be foisted upon us, that will be forced upon us. Fascinating. Um, so he, he responds, uh, we should, he says, well, we shouldn't be happy with that, that they're voicing that and forcing that upon us. He says, well, the Jewish people are a different nation, different people than all other nations. We're not like other nations. And we need to recognize that. And that was the end of that Yechidus. Fast forward 1976, um, sorry. That was 1972, after this, uh, the Yom Kippur War. Um, uh, after the Yom Kippur War, the um, Golda Meir resigns as Prime Minister of Israel and is succeeded by Yitzhak Rabin. He becomes the, the Prime Minister of Israel. This is 1974. Two years later, the Rebbe by Fabrinian says that he wants to strengthen the land of Israel and he's going to send Shluchim. Emissaries too in the land of Israel tend to go to Yerushalayim, tend to go to Tzfas, and I think 10 that would be in other places uh, throughout Israel. 30, some of them were uh, uh, young couples that were just married, some of them were actually uh, still uh, yeshiva students, they weren't married. And the Rebbe wrote a check uh, for $10,000 that I think it was to the Rosh Yeshiva that he gave to the head of the yeshiva who was accompanying these uh, couples and the yeshiva students, the, the shluchim, uh, $10,000 check that should be delivered to the Prime Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Rabin, as a gift from the Rebbe from Chabad for Yishuv Aretz for settling the land. For settling the land. Um, and with the words that Rabbi Mentlik, the Rosh Hashiva said, the Rebbe is, here's, hands him the check. I says, the Rebbe wants to remind you of your conversation that you had, which was 
four years earlier, and it says, Am Labadav Yishkoin, that the Jewish people are a unique nation that dwell alone. It's a reminder. That's 1976, fast forward, another um, uh, 20, uh, less than 20 years, um, 17 years later, 1993, Yitzhak Rabin is on the lawn of the White House together with uh, uh, President Clinton, together with um, Arafat. And what does, and we all know the famous shaking of the hands and the Oslo Accords and so on and so forth. What does Yitzhak Rabin say? I don't know if people remember, but he says, we are now no longer a nation that dwells alone. We are a nation that now has another people that we dwell amongst, the Palestinians. Those were his words. The message obviously did not penetrate from the Rebbe of the uniqueness of the Jewish people. The unique destiny of the Jewish people, the unique purpose of the Jewish people, and the Rebbe repeatedly would always speak about the land of Israel and call it the Holy Land and would re not refer to it as, as a nation state because as a nation state, we are just like another nation. We're just like another nation. But referring it to Eretz Yisrael, Eretz HaKodesh, the Holy Land because of the uniqueness of the land, the uniqueness of the people, of the uh, uniqueness of our history, and of course, of our destiny. So how, how is it that such a seemingly simple idea that I don't think personally, I mean, you know, maybe that was for the cameras, I don't know, maybe that was for the world that, you know, you had to say something that would be PC, and I'm not here to make the judgment, but how is it that there, that there could be people that wouldn't recognize the uniqueness of the Jewish people? How is it that Jews have a difficulty with it, that we have a unique destiny? Bilam in the end, who wants to curse the people, blesses and recognizes this and says as such. So, perhaps we can get a little understanding of that from another part of the Torah portion, which is the story of Amalek. Well, actually, it's not called Amalek in the Parsha's Chukas in the first Parsha. They didn't call themselves that way because they were defeated 39 years earlier. Um, if you recall, Moshe Rabbeinu, after the Jews come out of Egypt and they are such a unique nation coming out of slavery, receiving the, uh, getting ready to receive the Torah of Mount Sinai, and who dares to start up with him? The Amalekis, Amalek, and um, they're defeated. Actually, it's a, it's a beautiful story. A measure of stands on the mountain, and his hands, as long as his hands are raised, the Jews def are defeating the enemy. I guess it took some time, so the hands get tired. <laughs> and they start to lower. And when the hands lower, the uh, the Jews aren't doing so well. So the Chor and, and, and Aaron, I think it was, are holding up his hands, his arms. To me, that was just a, a sign what it means a righteous person on how, as we're coming from Gimel Tamos, um, a righteous individual is the conduit for godliness and holiness and vitality into this world and how that came through literally with his hands being raised that gave the vitality and the power to the jews 
to defeat the Amalekis. So now it comes 39 years later, after their defeat, they're still feeling it. And they recognize, you know what? We can't battle against these Jews in such a manner. So they kind of, they, uh, they change their garb in order that shouldn't recognize who they are. And they speak the Canaanite language so that the Israelites would think that they are Canaanites and not Amalekis. Why did they do that? Because this way, when the Jews pray to God, because just as Moshe Rabbeinu was with his hands up and praying to God, that that's the vitality that is brought into this world to give the Jews the added edge. So likewise, all Jews in their prayer to God Almighty give us the capability of transcending nature, of being able to fight a nation that is more powerful than us and defeating them. We're capable of doing that. So it's our prayers. So they recognize, well, if the Jews don't know who to pray for because we will be disguised. They will think that we are um, Canaanites. So they're going to pray to their God that they should be, wreak havoc and destroy the Canaanites. Well, their prayer won't be heard because we're not Canaanites, which is just like them, right? And uh, indeed... Uh, the Jews recognizing that there's something a little odd about them. They pray, but not specifically asking for the defeat of their enemy, the Canaanites, but for their enemy. And, of course, defeat them. Now, as we know, everything in the Torah is an eternal lesson. The, uh, Amalek, the, uh, the nation of Amalek. We have a mitzvah to decimate and destroy. Other nations, we don't have that mitzvah. We're actually today learning in Rambam the idea of battles that a Jewish king wages against nations of the world. Every nation of the world, if uh, we can make peace with them, we need to make peace with them and not, we don't, and, and there's no mitzvah to battle them, except for the Amaleki nation. So there's, many explanations of that, but we're going to go now into understanding on a metaphysical level. What is so bad about a Amalek? On a personal level, okay, as we've mentioned many times, Torah speaks to us personally, so we need to understand the personal concept of a Amalek from within. So the word Amalek is the same gematria as suffolk, which means doubt. The worst Thing that a Jew can have in their personal lives and collectively as a people is self-doubt on who we are and what we are. That needs to be eradicated. All other qualities that we may have, you don't have to eradicate. You don't have to battle them in a way to destroy them except for having self-doubt in ourselves, self-doubt in who we are as a people, self-doubt in our destiny. That needs to be completely eradicated. Interesting, the seven Canaanite nations are um, symbolic of the seven emotions. So again, everything is on a metaphysical level because Torah has to speak to us personally. So it's about the seven emotions. So those seven emotions, as we learned in the Rambam, divine providence, we learned in Rambam today, is that if those nations are ready to put up the white flag, don't battle them. They don't need to be destroyed. On a personal level, if the seven emotions of Chesed, Word, Presence, of Yisoyed, and Malchus, the negative emotions that we have in our soul, which we need to deal with, you don't have to decimate them. You can transform them. So kindness, sometimes we have a false sense of kindness because it's only kindness and only make me feel good. Well, that could be transformed. So you could do good and transform it and not do it based on because it makes me feel good. You know, many people are charitable because uh, uh, they look good. 
or they feel good through the charity that they go, they do. Well, that's coming from one of the attributes and that is negative, even though the action is a positive one, but the, the emotion behind it is a negative one. That can be transformed. It doesn't have to be uh, destroyed. But doubt. Having a doubt of sense of purpose, that you have a purpose, that God loves you, that God needs you to fulfill your purpose. That is the worst thing that a person can have. I would suggest that in the world that we live in today, this is a huge problem. Why is there so much anarchy going around? Because of self-doubt. If we would recognize that we have a purpose, a divine purpose, that we're needed for something to change the world for good, and we wouldn't be involved in our people wouldn't be in, involved in anarchy. There is more teenage suicide today than and recorded as ever recorded per capita than ever before. Why is that? Because people have a sense of self-doubt. What am I, what's my life worth? What's life? What's the value? And that self-doubt is extremely debilitating. So you, we can have that on a personal level. And that's why I, one of the things I do is uh, deal with people with uh, addictions. Addiction comes from that sense of self-doubt that I have a true value, a godly value, a divine value of my life. So you feel um, meaningless. So you need to give something that's going to make you feel good. The drug makes you feel good. You need something outside of you to bring something that is value. Since the self-doubt from within is there. And that is also on a collective level that many people, when it comes to the value of being a Jew or part of the Jewish people and part of the destiny of the Jewish people, that we are to be a light unto the nations and that we are unique and different. And because of that self-doubt, we feel that that's a curse. We feel that's a curse rather than recognizing that is a blessing. If we have the awareness and we choose, we choose it rather than it's forced upon us, then we will see it as a blessing in our lives rather than a curse. Any questions, folks? Any comments? Yes. All right, so you know what? I want to wish everybody an amazing, good Shabbos. Actually, give me a second. An amazing, good Shabbos. A meaningful one. A beautiful one. Um, and uh, when we have the, when, we, when we're so sure of who we are and how important our lives are, and that what I do really matters. Oh my gosh. Your day's a different day. Life is a different life. And the Shabbos will be a beautiful Shabbos. So wishing everybody a good Shabbos. Thank you all for joining. And uh, Sunday night, a reminder, 6.30 for the uh, Torah studies class. Right here, same station. Uh, good Shabbos. Be well. And thank you all for joining.